All right, section 4.1 is called divisibility. And we're going to start with um, taking a look at what it means for something to actually divide. And then we're going to look at some divisibility properties and rules. Some of them you've probably seen before. Some of them you may not have. Um, but um, they're, they're very interesting and they help us to take a look at a number, um, especially if we don't have a calculator present or we're working with younger children and asking these questions of whether something divides evenly. And they help us to make a decision about it without having to actually figure it out, like actually go through the division. So let's take a look at what it means to divide. So if A and D are whole numbers, and we say that D divides A, and that notation is written right here. It's a vertical bar, okay, D vertical bar A. So D divides A if and only if there is a unique whole number Q such that A equals DQ, not DQ as in disqualified for those of you who swim. That's, that's DQ, but that's not what this means. Um, if D divides A, then D is called a factor or a divisor of A, and A is called a multiple of D. So there's like a gazillion uh, vocabulary words in this one. Okay, I think it's two sentences, actually. And if I do an example with numbers, you're going to be like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. So that's what I'm going to do first. I'm going to give you an example with numbers. Um, so tell me what some number, I'll let you guys pick it. Tell me a number that divides another number, goes in evenly. Tell me one. All right, so 3 goes evenly into 6. So the notation would look like this, 3, and we read this as 3 divides 6. Okay, 3 divides 6. Um, so it's not um, a fraction bar. That's not what this vertical bar is. It's not what it is at all. In fact, it's sort of opposite in terms of the ordering of what a fraction bar would be. But this is 3 divides 6. And the reason that 3 divides 6 is because there exists a number Q, and the number here is 2. This is my Q value here. Where... 6 is equal to 3 times the 2. That's the reason that 3 is able to divide 6 is because there is another number 2 that when I multiply it by the number 3, I get back the number 6 that I started with. Okay, that's all this definition is saying. Now, there is some really good notation here that we use, and sometimes we use it inappropriately if we're not being careful. Um, we call this number that does this dividing a factor or a divisor. So this 3 is called a factor or a divisor. Okay. So that, that's an important piece of notation. And then we call the number 6 that it actually divides a multiple. So 6 is a multiple of 3. Um, and it helps for me to think about this this way. You think about your multiplication tables. Well, 6 is in the multiplication table of the 3s. So if I wrote out all the multiples of 3, 3, 6, 9, 12, 6 would be in that list. So 6 is considered a multiple of 3 because it's in that multiplication list. All right, we've got two theorems that we're going to do. The first one just has a little bit of writing, and the second one has a lot. Theorem 4.1 says, for any whole numbers, A and D, if D divides A and N is any whole number, then D divides A times N, or N times A. Okay, so all this is saying, we'll use our same numbers you just gave me before. We have 3, and we know that 3 divides 6. Well, it means that 3 will divide 6 times 4 as well. And it will divide 6 times 3 and 6 times 7 and 6 times 12. Anything I multiply it by, it's going to just still be divisible by 3. It's not going to change anything. Um, you can think of it another way. You could say, okay, well, that means that if 6 is in that multiplication list, you know, of the 3s, which it is, that's how this is defined, then anything that I multiply by in that list will also be in the list to, be to begin with. I just have another, another value in my list later on. So, for instance, this one that I've given you the example of, if I did this multiplication tables of threes, I'd have 3, 6, 9, 12. Eventually, I'm going to get to the number 24, right? It's going to be in that list. That's the 6 times the 4. Okay? So any number that's a multiple of my multiple will also be divisible by that same divisor. That sounded really good, didn't it? I should write that one down. All right, the next one's got a lot of writing. Are you guys ready? We have five properties we're going to all write out together. Um, and they have to do with addition and subtraction. So the first one says if, and they'll all start out um, similar, if D divides A, and the other condition on this one is D is also divides B. 
then D divides A plus B. So if you have two numbers that are divisible by the same value, then their sum is divisible by that value. So let's just do an example again with the 3 divides 6. Tell me another number that 3 divides. 9. So 3 divides 6 and 3 divides 9. Everybody good with that so far? What's 6 plus 9? 15. Does 3 divide 15? Yes, it does. Yeah, and it will work all the time. That's just one specific example, but that's a property that always holds. All right, a little bit of a different condition now at the beginning. Still going to say if D divides A. But now we're going to say D does not divide B. So I haven't used this symbol yet, but take a look at it. It's the same divide symbol <coughs> with the slash through it, kind of like when we do not equals and things like that, right? That little slash through it means it does not divide. So if D divides A and D does not divide B, what do you think is going to happen when we add the A and B together now? Yep, it does not divide A plus B. Okay, so let's still use our 3 divide 6. So 3 divide 6, we're all good with that. And 3 does not divide what? 4. four. 3 does not divide 4, right? Okay, what's 6 plus 4? Does 3 divide 10? Nope, it's not going to work not going to work. And anything we would try wouldn't work. There's nothing special about the number four. All right, we're going to take a look at some with subtraction next. All right, starting out the same way, D divides A. I promise not all of them start out with D divides A. Um, if D divides A and D divides B, and we're going to have one additional consideration here is that A is larger or equal to B. And I'll tell you why we need that in a minute. Then D divides A minus B. <clears throat> okay, so in the effort of not having a number that will, well, let's just use the numbers you just gave me a minute ago. So we have 3 divides 6 and 3 divides 9. The problem here is 6 is not greater than 9. So if I were to actually try and subtract 6 minus 9, I'd get a negative. Now, in general, that's not a problem, except that we haven't actually worked with negatives yet. That's in Chapter 5. So we're still working in the whole number system, and negatives aren't a part of our discussion yet. So it's actually a true statement without that in there. It's just that we're not working with negatives, so that's why that condition is there. Okay? So let's switch the order around so that we can actually have the values in the right order. And let's do 3 divides 9 and then 3 divides 6. Okay? So sure enough, then the 9 is greater than or equal to 6. What's 9 minus 6? 3. And does 3 divide 3? Yes, it does. So the subtraction of these does work. The order of it only matters in the sense that I want to keep positive numbers in my discussion. Okay. All right, we're going to write this exact same thing down, except what do you think I might change based on what we've already done in number two above? Yeah. If D divides A, D does not divide B, and I'm going to still have A is greater than or equal to B, then what do you think is going to happen to my result? It does not divide the difference A minus B. Okay, so let's use something that divides. Uh, in fact, I think the ones you gave me earlier will. So you had 3 divides 6, and we have 3 does not divide 4, right? 6 is bigger than 4, so that works. Um, and then I need 6 minus 4, which gives me 2. 3 does not divide 2. We good with that? Okay. All right, let's do one more. There is one caveat that we haven't done to this discussion, and I'll talk about why we didn't have to do it earlier. We're going to do D does not divide A, but D does divide B. Now, I'm going to pause for a moment after I write this down and talk about why we didn't need to do that before. Um, the condition is going to, or the, the conclusion is going to be just like it was before, D does not divide A minus B. So now, think above, we have this case one, case two, the first two bullet points here. The first one was everything divides. The second one was that the first piece is divisible and the second piece is not. When I'm doing addition, I can switch the order of these around, right? Because I could have A plus B or B plus A. That's that commutative property that some of you guys were telling me on your test. In fact, most of you were telling me on your test it works, right? It works for addition. Um, so when I actually switch, when I, when I actually consider addition, I don't have the ability to compute. 
that becomes the step number five down here. But because subtraction does not have a commutative property, that's why we have a step four and a step five down here that look a little bit different from one another. It's just because the, we want to make sure that we understand that even though subtraction is not commutative, we still have the same property if the difference of the division is in the first piece and not the second one. All right, so let's use a bigger number than six for a moment. So we'll use the three divides six for D divides B, but I need something bigger than six that does not divide by three. 10, okay, so three does not divide 10, right? Yeah, three does divide six, and 10 is bigger than six, all right? So what is 10 minus six? Four, and here again we get that three does not divide four. Okay, is everybody good with these? It'll help to remember them if you just try to create an example that, that would match them instead of actually remembering all the details in the um, actual location of the language that's going on instead of using numbers. All right, ready to get into something that's really interesting though? The things you can apply at a drop of a hat kind of stuff? Because that's where we're headed next. All right, we're going to see which of these you actually would remember. I should have left them blank so I could write them in with you. I should have done that. I'll have to do that next time. We have several divisibility tests. The first divisibility test that we talk about, and I put all three of these together for a reason, is that they're all very similar. So the first one is divisibility test for the number two. It says a whole number is divisible by two if and only if the unit's digit is even. A lot of times when I counter this one, students will tell me that it's divisible by two if it's even, but that's sort of an interchangeable word. Even, divisible by two, it means the same thing. It's not really a very good definition. What we really look at when we look at divisibility by two is simply the very last digit, right? I don't care what came at the beginning. All I care about is the very last number. That's what this is saying. That last number has to have a condition. It has to be zero, two, four, six, or eight. It has to be even. Divisibility test for five. A number is divisible by five if and only if its unit digit is a zero or a five. And then if you actually sort of combine the test for twos and the test for fives together, you get the test for 10, which makes sense because two times five is 10, right? Divisibility test for 10 says a number is divisible by 10 if and only if it ends in zero. I group all these together, but all of them require you to look simply at the very last digit. You can't do this and look at the very last digit for the number three, or the number six, or the number seven, or the number eight. None of them else, no, no other divisibility tests use these properties. These properties only apply to two, five, and ten. All you have to do is look at the last digit. Okay. Have you seen these ones before? Yeah, you should have. Maybe not presented quite this defined or this clear. Um, but that's how you make those de determinations, okay? All right, let's move into a different one. The next two go together very well, four and eight. Okay, so we do not, on the number four, look at the last digit. What do we look at? What's it say? The last two, the last two digits. Okay, so we look at the last two digits as a whole two-digit number. Okay, I don't want you to look at them separately like I've got two digits to look at. No, it's a two-digit number. So if the last two digits are a two and a four, we look at the number 24. If the last two digits are a three and a seven, we look at the number 37. Okay, if those last two digits as a two-digit number are divisible by four, then the whole thing is divisible by four, which is really, at that point, a lot like the previous two, three, rather, the previous three theorems. I'm just looking at the last two digits instead. And for the number eight, I'm looking at the last three digits. Now you might think to yourself, well, why for two, five, and 10 did I look at the last digit, and for four and eight, I look at the last two or the last three digits? Well, one way to think about that is that how does the number four come from the number two? How do you get it? By multiplying by two. I wanted to go the other direction. But you're, you're, you're on the right track, Caitlin, yeah. So I want to actually multiply by two. So if I were to do two times two or two squared, I'd have four, right? Two squared. Thinking along that line, what would I have to do for the eight? Four squared, 16. You're close. Two cubed. That's the one that's going to give it to us. Do you see the two and the three exponents? 
that's what's going on there, right? I've got two to the power of two. I've got two to the power of three. So I need two digits at the end, or I need three digits at the end to actually make my determination. The divisibility test for eight is fine. I don't find it to be a particularly useful test, and the reason is because I don't know my eights multiplication tables to three digits long. Do you guys? So, I mean, like, it's a cool fact, but I don't find it to be particularly useful. Um, the divisible test for four, where I look at the last two digits, is useful about half the time, right? I mean, maybe a little bit less than half, because I can tell you if a number is divisible, the last two digits, up to about 48, maybe, about half of the two-digit numbers. After that, I have to stop and think a little bit more hard, right? A little bit more hard. That was not very good. <laughs> a little bit harder. I have to think harder. Um, because if you give me the number 56, I, ha I have to really stop and see if that will work. If you give another 72 or, or something like that, I have to really think about, hard, think about that hard. Um, but it's doable. It's doable pretty quickly. And if you weren't using a calculator and you really were doing it by hand, it's still going to be easier to actually take the number 8 and to divide it into a three-digit number than, a, say, a seven-digit number, right? This doesn't become quite so much of a mental exercise for these two, but it does shorten the question. If you're just wanting to know, does it divide by 8? and I've got a six-digit number, well, I only have to take the last three digits to see. So that, in that sense, it's actually pretty nice. All right, there's another two of them that go together very nicely, and that's the test for three and nine. Have you guys seen the tests for three and nine before? For some reason, people have usually seen the test for three and not for nine, which is strange because they're the exact same test. The way that you can know if a number is divisible by three is you add all of its digits together and if the sum is divisible by 3, then the original number was divisible by 3. I remember the first time that somebody told me this, and I thought, oh my goodness, where has this rule been my whole life? Not joking. I really just couldn't believe that I'd never heard it before. Uh, the first time I was presented with it was actually in high school. Um, but my daughter, um, who is in sixth grade, has come across this. Um, and I don't know if she came across it in fifth grade or in sixth grade. So this is an upper elementary, early junior high kind of question that you're looking at, divisibility. But the divisibility test for 9 is exactly the same thing. You sum all the values, and if it's divisible by 9, then it works to be divisible by 9 for the whole value to begin with as well. So it's the same test. If you've already added the digits together, you can make the determination about 3 and 9 at the same time. So that's kind of cool. The last two tests are in no way related. They are on the same slide because they fit nicely on the same slide. They are in no way related. And the first one looks awful. So I want you to write it down. I'll read it as you write it. Um, and then we'll actually talk about what it actually means because it sounds awfully strange. OK, you ready? It's divisibility test for 11. A whole number is divisible by 11, if and only if. The sum of the digits in the places of even powers of 10 minus the sum of the digits in the place of odd powers of 10 is divisible by 11. Just write it down. Doing the test is easy. Describing the test is weird. And you're welcome to write down the divisible test for six if you want to. Um, we'll, we'll get to that in a second. But When you are done writing, if you'll put your pencil down just so that I can keep track of <laughs> who's finished and who's not. Thank you. Okay. 
think that's everyone. Is that everybody? Okay. I want you to give me a really long number. And I don't mean like crazy long, but give me something that's like eight or ten digits long. Just a whole bunch of numbers in a row. So somebody, who wants to volunteer? Amanda does. Okay, Amanda, give me, give me eight digits. Awesome. Okay. We're given some weird number. What is this even odd powers of 10? Well, here's the deal. Each of these is in a place value of a power of 10, right? So this, the first, the 1, is in the 10 to the 0's place. The 9 is in the 10 to the 1. The 7 is in the 10 squared, 10 cubed, <coughs> 10 to the 4th, and so on, right? So these are all powers of 10, the placeholder. All this is saying is that if I use every other digit and I add those digits together, Okay, so let's add together all the ones I circled in orange. What is 4 plus 3 plus 2, 9, and then 9 plus my last 9 would be 18. Okay, so the sum of my orange circled numbers is 18. Okay, let me circle other ones in black. So now I've got 5, 1, 7, and 1. And we're going to do the same thing. We're going to add them together. 5 plus 1 is... 6. 6 plus 7 is 13, plus the 1 at the end is 14. So I've got the sum of 14. And then what I do is I subtract those two sums. I subtract 18 minus 14. What do I get? I get 4. And this number right here tells me everything I need to know. Is 4 divisible by 11? No. So the first number wasn't either. The test is not that hard, right? All I have to do is count every other digit and add them up. And then I count the other ones and I add them up. I subtract <coughs> those two values and I look at that result. If that result is divisible by 11, then the original number that Amanda made up for me would have been as well. Okay? So they have to vary a lot, right? Either they have to be the exact same value. Like let's say they both ended up being 19. 19 minus 19 would be 0. Is 0 divisible by 11? Yes, zero is divisible by anything. It's great. So that would actually work. So if the sums were exactly the same, this would be divisible by 11. Or if the sums were different by 11, or different by 22, or different by 33, are you guys with me? That's what it would take to be divisible by 11. So most numbers are not divisible by 11, right? Because they're awfully spread out sort of differences that I would have to be getting. Divisibility test for 6 is very interesting. It says that if a number is divisible by 6, that works if and only if it's divisible by 2 and 3. So speculate with me here. Why is this working as our test? Because 2 times 3 is 6. Now we do have to be careful. This is a divisibility test for 6. It's not a divisibility test for 8 or 12 or something like that. But it does generalize in certain ways to those other values. There's something special about 6, 2, and 3 that make this happen. I'm going to give you some other examples of ones that work just like this one, and then I'm going to give you some examples of ones that don't. And let's see if we can figure out what it takes to make this work and what it takes to make it not. If I wanted to do a divisibility test for 15, I could look at 5 and 3, and that would work. Okay, so that's the ones I'm working on first for you. These work. If I wanted to do a divisibility test for 12, um, I could do 3 and 4, and those would work. If I wanted to do a divisibility test for 30, I could do 3 and 10, and those would work. Okay, so all of these work. I think that's probably enough. And then I'm going to do some that, some that won't work. All right, these do not work. If I wanted to do a divisibility test for 8 and I tried 2 and 4, that won't work. If I wanted to do a divisibility test for um, uh, let's see, how about 18? And I did 3 and 6, those would not work. If I wanted to do a divisibility test for 12, and I didn't use the 3 and the 4 over here, but instead I used a 2 and a 6. Those would not work. I want you to take just a minute 
And I want you to look at the ones that work and that don't work. I mean, exactly like I'm going to time it on my watch one minute. I want you to think about it. And then you're going to be in a partner pair for a minute and see if you can come up with a reason why this might be the case. Let me come up with an example that I don't want. Um, how about 24? That's a good one. That's another one that doesn't work. All right. Some people define mathematics as the study of patterns. Can you see how that makes sense for how people would define or describe what math is, looking at patterns and things? This is one of those things that's a pattern that we should be able to look at and try and figure out. So. Without discussing what you think your pattern is, Amanda, can you give me an example based on what you think that the pattern is of one that will work with your description? That would work. What about you guys? Caitlin, Kaylee, what do you guys think? Can you give me an example of one that will work if you've got your description right? Yeah, they, I'm not sure. Don't tell me what your, what your rule is. Yeah, um, okay. Uh, 21, 3, and 7. Okay, that would work. We don't have a test for 7, but if it were divisible by the 7 and the right. 3, yes, that would work. <laughs> They're not helping, are they? Nobody's helping. Okay, we're going to create, we're going to have those two of you who think you have an idea to do the same thing for something that won't work. Okay? And then we're going to talk before um, you give an example about why I chose to write down the ones that I did, because I didn't do it for my notes, I was just thinking. Can you think of ones that won't work? Yep, 2 and 10 will not work for 20. Correct. Those won't work either. Okay, so here is the one odd duck from the rest of them at the moment. That's what I was trying to come up with at the end. If we ignore that one and we look at all the rest of the numbers, what does it look like all the rest of the numbers in the won't work square have going on between them? Yeah. 2 divides 4, 3 divides 6, 2 divides 6, 3 divides 12, 2 divides 10. All the ones that are here and not circled, this, not this 24, 4, and 6, but all the rest of them look like that the issue might be that one of them divides the other one. Doesn't that kind of what it looks like? And that, that doesn't happen on my other list, right? They don't have that property. And then I threw this weird one in where I said, now wait a minute, I need one more because I don't want you to think that that's the property because that's not it. 4 and 6 won't work for 24 either. And then I made a mess, didn't I? Because you were like, oh man, I thought I knew what it was, and now I've got that weird 24, 6 going on. 24, 4, and 6. All right, so let's start with Tasha. Do you want to describe what you had for your thought about what was going on? Oh. What did your group think? For, for how it works or doesn't work? That the. There's this, that old thing. Yeah, but 24, 4, and 6 aren't divisible by each other either, and they also don't work. It's an exception. <laughs> I can come up with more exceptions, though, unfortunately. What do you guys think? Kaylee, did you guys have an idea? I mean, that was our idea, too. I don't know. Like, Go ahead, Caitlin. The reason why, like, those won't work is they're all divisible by the same number. Like, and I don't know if that's right, but, like, 3 and 6, they're not divisible by 3. Okay. So, really... Okay, is that what you're thinking too, Amanda? Yeah, that's actually the deal. That's the deal. So what the deal is, is that all of these over here, the two numbers that I've considered, no matter what they are, do in fact divide by something else. Maybe not each other, but something else. So like the 2 and the 4 and this 8, they're both divisible by 2. 
The 3 and the 6 are both divisible by 3, but even the 24, even though they're not divisible by each other, that happens. 24 is 4 times 6, but 4 and 6 are both divisible by 2, okay? Now look at this list over here. That never happens, does it? 5 and 3 don't divide by anything. They all divide by 1, so ignoring the number 1 for the moment. 3 and, three and 4, they don't divide by anything. 3 and 10, 9 and 2, 3 and 7, they never have the ability that they're both divisible by something. Um, it, I think it's in section 4.2, which we'll get to next week. That property is called being relatively prime. It doesn't mean the numbers are prime. It means they have nothing in common, no other factors but one. That's what's going on. That's why 6 works to break it down into 2 and 3, is because 2 and 3 have nothing, no factors in common. So you can actually use this divisibility test for 6 with lots of other things, but you do have to be careful that the numbers you pick to divide it down into don't have factors in common. So for example, when Amanda had asked me about 30, 30 works with 3 and 10, but it also works with 5 and 6, right? Because 5 and 6 have nothing in common. Agreed? Sure, sure. Um, so both of those would work. 24 does not work with 4 and 6, but can you come up with something that 24 would work with? 3 and 8, right? It's other factors that make up 24, but they don't have anything in common now. Okay, you guys are awesome. Well done. Okay. We have a few more minutes, so let's take a look at the next things. We're going to actually take a number, and we're going to see if it's divisible by each of these divisibility tests that we have. So these are the numbers for which we have divisibility tests. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8, 9, 10, 11, and very sadly, there's nothing in there for 7. He just totally gets left out. It's very sad. But there just must not be one, um, because I've never seen one presented, that there's not a shortcut way of determining that. You just have to divide it, unfortunately. So, yeah. All right, we have the number 24,015, and we're going to check one at a time through all this list to see if it works. So we're going to look at the number 2. Is the number divisible by 2? No. Why not? Right. It's not that it's even, right? I mean, it is, but it doesn't end in an even, right? How about 3? Yes. How did you decide if it was divisible by 3? What do you do? Okay, so you did 2 plus 4 plus 0 plus 1 plus 5. What does that equal when we sum those? 12. 12. Is 12 divisible by 3? Yes. So, the first one is as well. Let me pause for that. Something interesting though. Let's say, for instance, you added the numbers together and you didn't get 12. You got something that was very large. I mean, it's something that you really weren't sure about. Well, take a look at 12 with me for a moment. What happens if I take the number 12 and I add the number 1 plus 2 together? You get 3. And is that number divisible by 3? Yes, it is. So this process repeats itself. So you could actually get something at the end that you could add those two digits together if you wanted to to double check on, too, which is pretty cool. All right, this is 3s. Uh, 4 is the next one. Is it divisible by 4? No. Why not? Yeah, because 15 is not divisible. by 4. Um, notationally, we could say something like this. We could write 4 does not divide 15. That's the notation we were looking at in the previous slides. Five's our next one. How about five? Yes. yes. Why? Yes, because it ends in five. Uh, six. <laughs> No. <coughs> What's wrong with six? It's not by the numbers. Yeah, so the divisibility test for six has to do with going back to the numbers two and three. So the issue is that it doesn't divide by three. I didn't say that right. It does divide by three. It doesn't divide by two. So it has to divide by both 2 and 3 to be divisible by 6. This one doesn't work. 
After six, we skip seven. We don't have it, but we have an eight. Luckily, the number eight actually uses the last three digits, and the last three digits start with a zero, kind of like that. So what's this one going to be? No. Because why? Eight does not divide zero one five. So I'll write that in the, the new look language, math language that we have now. Eight does not divide zero one five. That was eight. I have a test for nine. That's my next one. Does nine divide this number? No. We already summed our value together before, right? Two plus four plus zero plus one plus five. What was our sum? Twelve. What does that tell me? What do I do, what do, I do with the 12? I try to divide it by 9. So does 9 divide 12? Yes. No, it does not. 9 does not divide 12, so 9 will not divide the original number either. That's 9. Uh, 10. How about 10? No, why not? No, it doesn't end in a 0. Awesome. Of one more. The funny test 11. Okay, so I'm going to leave it blank on the no, yes thing, and I'm going to write the number out, and we're going to do it together. 24015. What do I do with these digits? I do some summing, right? I add every other one. So I circled three of them in blue. What's the sum of my blue circled values? Seven. And then I'm going to circle in orange the ones I skipped, and the sum of those is... Five. And if you got a bigger value, and instant, like if I had gotten five first and then seven, we just switch the order, right? What is seven minus five? Two. Does 11 divide two? No, it doesn't. It's too small, right? I mean, I need a zero or an 11 or a 22 or something like that. That doesn't work. Two doesn't work. 11 does not divide two, so is this number divisible by 11? No, it's not. All right, any questions on those? Let me make one comment about this. Um, when you do this in your homework, your homework never asks, I don't, it seldom asks you to justify your answer. We justified all of our answers here. When I ask a question like this on the test, I guarantee you you're going to have to justify things. So if you want, as you're doing your homework, to be in the practice of doing that, at least in your head, justify it. Make sure that you understand why you've said yes or no. If you aren't sure, based on these rules, then you need to ask a question to somebody about it, okay? Because what will happen occasionally when I ask a question like this, like, is this number divisible by five? I'll have somebody, they'll say something like, no, because five does not divide 2,416. Well, basically you just said no because it doesn't work. That's not the point. You're supposed to be using these rules to make that decision. I know that it doesn't work. I know that you have a calculator. I know you can test it and you can see. That's not the point. The point is actually applying these shortcut ways of making that decision if you weren't going to do it out longhand. Does that make sense? Okay, fabulous. We are going to stop right there.